thing is to make planning subcommittee members aware of planning proposals coming forward. Uh, it'll be followed by an informal discussion that will take place on the proposals on the agenda. Uh, my name is Councillor Steve Rice and I'll be chairing this evening's meeting. Uh, the meeting will be recorded and is being live streamed on YouTube. Councillors taking part this evening are present here in the committee room and uh, maybe online, um, which they are able to be because uh, we're not taking a decision. Um, if any committee members are accessing the meeting remotely, they're reminded uh, they're not counted as being present uh, for the purposes of Local Government Act 1972. At my discretion, the Mayor, however, contributes to the, com uh, to the discussion. Uh, welcome to any members of the public. Welcome to former um, committee chair, Council Stops, uh, ex Council Stops over there in the uh, in the corner as well, and any press who join us uh, this evening. Uh, while these pre-application meetings are open to members of the public and press, there are no speaking rights. And for anyone joining the meeting remotely via Google Meet, there is a chat function. However, please only use this to, re uh, to raise IT-related issues. As chair of this subcommittee, I will not be monitoring it. Meeting participants are reminded to turn the mobile phones off or put them on silent. And please note that any persistent disruptive behavior will result in you being asked to leave the meeting. In the event of an internet outage, we'll adjourn the meeting and then come back and continue once it's resolved. Um, firstly, I'll turn to my fellow planning subcommittee members and ask them to please introduce themselves, starting with Councillor Desmond. Councillor Michael Des Desmond, Hackney Downs Ward. Uh, Councillor John Narcross, Haggerston. Councillor Alex Sadek, Beach Park Ward. Councillor Webb, um, Hackney Wick Ward. Great, thank you very much. Um, there are various council officers present as meeting this evening, both in the room and joining us remotely, including the following. We've got designated planning officer Nick Bavard. Uh, we've got other council officers in, in attendance, including our um, council representatives, Lucy and Grave, Matt Payne, Adam Dyer, Peter Kelly. And we've also got Natalie Broughton to my right, who's the assistant director of planning and building control. We have the growth team manager, Graham Callum. We have Governance Services Officer to my left, Gareth Sykes. Uh, we have uh, to my further right, our Legal Officer, Christine Stevenson, and online we have Mario Caraman, our ICT Officer. Um, and welcome to Councillor Young, who's joined online as well. Uh, the, I'll briefly outline how this meeting will proceed. So the Planning Officer will briefly introduce the planning proposals on the agenda. We'll then hear from the developer and their representatives. We'll give a brief overview of what they're proposing to come forward uh, to a future planning subcommittee meeting for a decision. Uh, members of the planning subcommittee will then be free to ask questions of planning officer or the developer and their representatives. Please note that Committee members will not be voting on any recommendations at this meeting. The final application will be subject to a report at a future meeting of the planning subcommittee. So no decisions will be taken this evening. Finally, depending on how the meeting this evening progresses, we'll take a short break at around 8 p.m. I uh, will now go to the published meeting's order of business, beginning with item one, apologies for absence, Gara. Chair, I'm not aware of any apologies for absence for this meeting. Great, thank you very much. Um, do any members of the committee have any declarations of interest? Okay. No, thank you very much. Um, do we have any proposals or questions referred to the subcommittee? None, Chair. Thank you very much. Do we? No? Great. Oh. Thank Is there no way we can turn the sound down from, from the TV? Uh, are we trying to eliminate the, the slight feedback. reverb? Yeah. Um, it sounds coming out of it, so clearly volume is, yeah. Yeah. From the volume down. I have tried to resolve this issue earlier on today. Um, there is a little bit of a reverb. Um, I can try and muck around with it. Yeah. Yeah. It'll mute. We'll just yeah. turn it off entirely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll turn what sound coming out, do we? It'll never sound better. Doesn't it sound better? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, thank you to the gentleman over Okay, well thank you very much. Well done. <laughs> um, I've already ruined the IT ones tonight. I'm not touching it. Don't touch it. So. Right. Uh, there are no minutes um, to approve on That's agenda correct, item yeah. number four. Um, so therefore, we move to agenda item number five, Shoreditch Works, site location one two five, on Curtin Road, Worship Street, Bluewell Road, and Scruton Street. Um, so handing over to Nick. Thank you. Right. The proposal involves redevelopment of a 1.3 hectare site and represents one of the largest opportunities for comprehensive employment-led development in the borough. The opportunities to provide a full range of uses on an underdeveloped site. The site occupies most of an urban block within the South Shoreditch Conservation Area. The red line boundary can be seen on this image. Notable exclusions from the red line boundary are the locally listed terraces of Hollywell Row and the large warehouse-style corner building on Worship Square, both shown in yellow here. 
The urban block as a whole is considered a key development site in the city fringe opportunity area planning framework and is an allocated site in current and emerging local policy. Looking north, the building heights on the site range from three to six storeys, and there are a number of rear yards serving various buildings in the block. There are currently a mix of uses on site with offices, residential and retail and community uses. It's lo located within the South Shoreditch Conservation Area, contains listed buildings, locally listed buildings, and buildings identified as being Townscape Merit in the South Shoreditch Conservation Area appraisal. The block was war damaged and also contains a lot of post war development. This is the existing view down Worship Street with the site on the right, looking down Curtain Road with the site on the right. This is the corner of Curtain Road and Sutton, Scruton Street. In the following images of the existing townscape, the site is shown on the left. This is Scrutton Street. Scrutton Street at the corner with Fitt Street. Most of the locally listed buildings on the left are not part of the site. The warehouse style building in the foreground is also not part of the site. The Philip Ware buildings are grade two star listed. The Philip Webb buildings would be retained and refurbished, as would the locally listed buildings and buildings of Townscape Merit. An issue of interest throughout the pre-application process has been the extent to which the tower would be visible above the Grade 2 star listed buildings. These images show previous stages of design, and we will expect to see the current proposal detailed in this way too. The new floor space would be employment-led, but with active frontages at ground floor level, set around new public realm within the interior of the block, including a double-height urban room shown in pink in the centre of this image. At first floor, the office space is shown in blue. And this plan shows the location of the residential units, of which 78 are proposed, an increase from the 38 units that are on the existing site. The proposal seeks to replace the post-war buildings around the perimeter and to build a tower on Curtain Road, which builds in height towards the centre of the site. The tower can be seen here behind proposed Plot B, a corner building in the foreground of the image. The following slides show the general methodology for the perimeter buildings, which is to replace post-war frontages and to build up additional setback stories behind retained buildings. 52 to 56 Grutton Street is a building of townscape merit in the middle here. And this is the corresponding Scrutton Street elevation for Plot B alone. It's the same building. Curtain Road is the dividing line between the conservation area and the city scale buildings of the stage development. The proposed tower is shown here, and this is the other side of the Plot B building you've just seen. Proposals can be seen in context on this exonometric diagram with city scale buildings sitting adjacent to the conservation area. Zoomed in. Plot B is here, with the tower behind it. The following two views show the current scheme in a wider context. This is looking down Phipps Street from Luke Street. Looking at some more of the individual buildings that are to be created, Plot D is a statement building that stands at one of the proposed entrance ways to the centre of the site. 7 to 11 Curtain Road is an extension above an existing single storey heritage building. It's positioned next to the tower and one of the undercroft routes that the site can be seen in this image. Yeah. This selection of views shows the proposed residential development with the eight storey plot L building in yellow brick in the bottom right hand image and the muse behind the Philip Webb building shown at the top right. This would improve the permeability of the site by the creation of four main routes through. The entrance to the northwest, shown as one on this diagram, is open to the sky, marked by the plot B, plot B building that you saw, which is here. The other routes two, three, and four are through undercrofts of various lengths. And this is the new central space, which the applicants consider to be one of the main public benefits of the scheme. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, fantastic. So we move on to developer representatives. So, um, would you mind doing some introductions yourself of um, who will be speaking and answering questions? That'd be great. And who am I looking at first? It's probably great. me. It's, Hello. Um, so to explain, uh, my name is Guy Bransby. I'm a planning consultant, and I work for Montague Evans. Uh, you're going to hear from 
three other speakers tonight, and the rest of you is assembled for questions. Uh, Howard Kaufman is going to talk first. He's representing the client today. John Bushell, you see next, uh, who's the architect at KPF. And then Jane, do you want to just quickly say what your role is? Uh, my name's Jane Button, and I'm the principal at Southwark College, a part of Newcastle College's group, just based in the current of Waterloo. Cool. Thank you. Would you like to do it with the other uh, yeah, why not? Go ahead. Okay, so, yeah, why not? Uh, Charlie Hammond, I'm, I, I work for the one side of the joint venture on, on the, the delivery side. Brett Davis from the State Office Shoreditch, we're the other side of the joint venture. Okay, do you want to go next? Uh, Simone and Richard again, TKPS. Uh, uh, Great, thank you very much. Uh, it's time from good people. Okay, fantastic. Um, Go ahead. Thank you. With your permission, I know we have 15 minutes to present and we don't have a model with us tonight, but we do have a short two minute video, which effectively serves the purpose of a model. It takes you out in the scheme. If we can make that work, we'd quite like to show you that at the end of our presentation, if that's OK with everybody. Yep, fine. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. OK, we'll make a start. Howard. Uh, good evening, members and officers. Um, my name is Howard Kaufman. And I represent Linear Developments, which is a joint venture between two families, both with long established roots in the borough of Hackney and more particularly in Shoreditch. These roots go back more than 50 years. The reason I represent the families is, is that I have also worked in and around Shoreditch since 1977. And I've worked on a number of major regeneration schemes in the area, including Principal Place, which I did on behalf of the borough of Hackney. Both families have helped shape the landscape and community of Shoreditch through a range of their developments, including loft living, live work, creative hubs, startups, tech businesses, both large and small. Successful projects completed include the stage Shoreditch, where home to first, Hackney's first scheduled ancient monument, and Crown Place, both of which have made significant contributions to Hackney's economic landscape. This 4.5 acre site has taken three, acre, uh, three decades to assemble. It is a large and complex site, and our journey towards a planning application has required significant resource and has taken several years, culminating in our intention to submit in the next couple of months. We have assembled a best-in-class professional team and have been diligent in engaging with the borough's planning and regeneration teams, as well as other stakeholders within the council and the local community. We have had the benefit of two design review panels and held a successful public exhibition in December last year. As you will hear, we are proposing to develop Hackney's first regenerative business hub, which will bring significant social, economic, economic and cultural benefits to the local community. In addition, our commitment is such that our client would retain, restore and celebrate all of the heritage assets on the site most notably the Philip Webb Terrace on Worship Street at a cost of many millions of pounds. We wish to act responsibly and deliver an exemplary scheme for Shoreditch and the borough in general, where both families, families, businesses have been based for many years. We are exceeding current targets by offering three times the amount of residential floor space that currently exists, effectively doubling the number of units on site what is essentially an employment-led location. We are delivering policy-compliant affordable workspace, totaling 44,000 square feet, and partnering with good people, Green Labs, New City College, and the Shoreditch Trust. We fully get the need to deliver positive change to the local community, and we will deliver a significant program of social impact through this development. The site is currently landlocked and inaccessible to the public. We will transform the permeability through multiple access routes leading to high quality open space and a 10,000 square foot urban room covered for community use, delivering socially responsible change and helping the borough meet its commendable social inclusive policies. Only through comprehensive development can we achieve the package of um, incentives that this scheme offers? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. John. We um, have been very much enjoying working for uh, these clients who have spent such a long time thinking about the site and very much invested in Hackney for several generations. 
So what we're going to explain to you this evening is both a proposal in terms of architecture, but also in terms of all of the other purpose that the, the social purpose that the clients have and how we're providing frameworks for that space and opportunities for that to work. That doesn't happen by accident. So this is a proposal where we're not saying, and something will happen on the ground floor. We're saying there's an assembly of different groups and we're designing the spaces for those groups for their success. There is a whole set of benefits that I think um, you've seen before, and maybe we'll pass around as we're going through, but yeah. there's a, a, a sort of a jobs not only of people working in the building, but outreach and ways in which we can help the local communities. So we can make our project relevant to locals as well as trying to make it relevant to the Hackney's economy. Um, and then uh, make it a place that is truly active. And that doesn't, again, happen by accident anymore. Retail may have been the site of the public realm once. That doesn't really work anymore. So you have to work very, very hard to make these things happen. All of this, we would expect them to be embodied in the Section 106. So these become real commitments, real commitments to producing jobs outside of the project, to provide the accessible, affordable workspace to people who have been identified. So it becomes something, and this is a little bit pioneered uh, in, in, in Southern and to other places, it becomes a full and rounded proposal. Um, we've been at this a very uh, little while, um, with lots of interaction, and the scheme has changed a lot. So roughly over 20% smaller than, uh, and with them when we uh, started in terms of the plant's objectives, and that's around wanting to provide something that was a critical mass of office space of different typologies, which we'll show you in a moment. Uh, we have seen design review panels, uh, both Design Southeast and the Hackney Design Review Panels, who have been very supportive of the scheme, have been supportive of the public spaces, but felt it needed to have more animation, which is one of the reasons why we have a wider group involved. Uh, they understood and, uh, and supported the idea of some height very, very carefully located on the site, but talked a lot about the quality of the building and how that interacted with views and other things. Um, and then they also uh, liked the idea of mixed use, but could see that that needed to be very carefully managed and, uh, and, and, and organized. So that journey includes a, a very big change in the uh, residential and then making that into a, an area that feels like it's an entity appropriate, a huge amount of effort into how we make the benefits of the place making as as suggested more than just the visuals of a square but everything that goes with it and it's transformable and to work incredibly hard to not give up the idea that this site right adjacent to the city and in the central activity zone should provide lots of employment but it should do that in a way which is entirely compatible with the other sensitivities of the site so to remind you, it's in the central activity zone and for uh, a considerable period of time, the GLA and Hackney have seen this as a very important uh, area for good employment. Uh, we are also in the conservation area, but in the part of the conservation area that was most severely bombed during the war. So it's an extremely variable context and place visually and with a lot of empty space in the middle of the site. Those heritage buildings that have um, survived all of that history, we are and um, taking great care over. The web terrace is the primary one, and we'll show you in a moment we are improving the setting of that. So the um, the one point that was pointed out, many, many other benefits. So we go around on all of the heritage buildings that I've got. Web terrace, an amazing uh, pioneer of the live and work typology, um, over 10 million pounds spent in renovating just its physical fabric. But then if you can see in the bottom of the slide, all sorts of rubbish has developed over many decades, all of that is removed to get, take it back to what the terrace used to be. So there's a, a lot of sort of space taken away. Uh, and then the new typology that is historic is is, is really made. So the setting of this is hugely improved by those work, those works. As you walk up and down the um, Worship Street, you can see the chimneys of this building overlapping with all of the other built buildings there. And we're we've only a very small addition to that. So it's not a new thing in terms of what's happening in the other buildings. And to complete the terrace the little, uh, building at the end, miscellaneous buildings have become residential and are again basically always taken back to their historic core. And uh, then the important uh, heritage of, of, uh, of workshop, um, uh, both into the entities, the beautiful uh, buildings of James Spatter on uh, Scrap Complete, and the building that again is highlighted in other uh, buildings on, on Scrap Complete 52 to 56. Just to say that actually that building has had a huge amount of work done to it, so it's not a pure heritage asset. We're keeping the definition of it as an entity, 
all of the facades, etc., all of the floors internally, but it does become part of a, a larger composition. Um, and then the big point is that we're trying to wear all of those gaps up that are not heritage building to provide appropriate background traditional buildings that are trying to complete the ensemble and understanding of this as a conservation area. So you'll see top left is the very, very tired 50s, 60s buildings to the right that we make it feel like a conservation area. Again, in, in the middle, um, along Curtin Road, and then to the right, and along Stratton Street, and then something that is celebrating more the Victorian typologies and the nature of conservation areas. So we actually see keeping the heritage and then mending all of those breaks and, and damages being extremely strong. All the way around the perimeter, we are widening, creating some new greenery and completing the idea that this will finally feel like it's part of a conservation area in its entity. It's entirely um, closed and we want to make this actually a fantastic destination and some of that's in between the city and the rest of um, Georgia, but also linking to the stage. And so there's a total transformation in terms of the amount of public space here, absolutely huge uplift, and it becomes a destination and a place, not only a place, but a, a sort of a linking um, building. So we've added in, two, there's, a, there's a passageway existing on the site, um, all the undercroft, the, the undercroft is existing there at the moment, the, our, our version of light is identical, and the new arcade that are really synergies between this site and the stage, and then very clear routes north-south and through and diagonal. So it transforms it as a place that uh, is part of the urban network of streets. And this shows the view, so the left-hand side is from the north and from the south, and the right-hand side is the new route through the warehouse and the re, uh, remaking of the existing route through into the site. So a, the complexity and granularity of the conservation area and all those small buildings is entirely kept within the character of our proposals. So we're not simplifying, in fact, we're embracing and maybe even making it more complicated. And that will help again for it to feel like it's part of uh, the conservation area, but with a space in the middle, um, an urban yard, and a little bit hard to see, but it's a mixture of inside and a space that can be either open, so it's all connected, or closed when it's raining, etc. We're calling it an urban room, and maybe a better name. You can see the residential groups at the southern end of the site. Um, so the build that that's setting up the kind of approach. So we wanted to then highlight that between with people and Jane. The, uh, the, the, the link is to, to be made from all of those initial moves and actually what counts and makes an impact in terms of community. Thank you. So, as I mentioned, I'm the principal of uh, Sabbath College and I've been in post-16 education for the last 24 years, born and bred in East London and worked for eight years in the uh, sixth form college, actually B6 in Hackney, which is your local sixth form college, which was one of my highlights of my career. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with good people for over 18 months and anyone who's been in our sector knows with the challenges of the London local skills plans and the statutory obligations for colleges to work with employers, what a tricky terrain it is. That's partly been post pandemic, but it's not just been that and we had problems with working with employers before the pandemic. Securing good quality um, local opportunities for young people and adults in South London is really challenging and I will and I remember how difficult it was when I was at uh, B6 in the sixth form. Um, since working with uh, richer good people we have secured good quality high profile opportunities for our young people um, in particular helping us with our digital T level which is an incredibly challenging piece of curriculum without which we wouldn't have been able to launch and we've secured over a hundred learners going through a company called Cherry which is a large uh, company in Southwark. Uh, this is making a real difference to our students life opportunities and we know that we serve some of the most disadvantaged not just in London but in the country. Um, in order for this to make a real social impact, uh, educationists like myself need companies like Good People, in particular Rich, to help us navigate employer landscapes. I'm good at getting students through qualifications. It's really tough to do the, the engagement piece with employers and with the help of Rich and his team, we've been able to get our students into places that would have, would have been way beyond us. Thank you. Thank you. So there's a cultural strategy that please ask us about. Green Labs, with amazing uh, creativity to the affordable space that we have signed, they are signed up to our side. Then the Crafts Council, which will bring 
um, groups of young people in the urban room, top right is Islington, bottom Westminster, left Vancouver. But it's a huge transferable space that we will um, make active. This is the version of the science reference to imagine exhibitions in the evenings, uh, events that the community could have. Um, lots of different ways in which it can help animate the space and there's continued work on the detail of that space from a group of artists and local artists and people. So it's a family of buildings, not something that's repetitive, they're all different. They respect the variety that is in uh, the wider area and they reflect the, the residential and the warehouse and the uh, kind of calm background buildings. The big key point to note here though is to make a real difference, we need different types of workspace to um, attract the very wide range of tenants that are here. So tech and fintech, craft creative, etc. So what we need is not only lots of the warehouses and the well prepared warehouses, but a big building that will be a unique offer in Hackney. And that has been amazingly carefully positioned in terms of not being on any of the local view lines, not being in any of the LVMFs. It's gone through a real journey of becoming a smaller building. Um, and it is of, uh, of the warehouse typology that is grown out of, or as a composition, it feels like it's a part of the language of the building. So just to show you, and I mean, we can go through these in more detail, but there is no substantial harm anywhere here. We have worked and worked and worked to get to the point where it's an incidental part of all of these views, it's not seen from the sensitive areas, and it's been removed from all of these views where we started from. So, and it's not in any of LVMS, it can't be seen from Bunhill Fields. Its location, its reduction in its height, etc., all have really tested the premise that can a site of such importance and such kind of potential create one bigger building within it that does not actually have a detrimental effect with the conservation area? And in every other way, we're strengthening something that you wouldn't necessarily recognize as a conservation area. Sun is good, there's no daylight impact, there's no wind issues. And just to show, um, the, the left hand side is the public realm. The middle <coughs> is actually to show that the majority of the site is all at the massing and the level of the surroundings. And there is just the one exception, building A, uh, which is the sort of the, the, the additional thing. This is not new to this conservation area. Don't know if you want to say it, but very probably can come back to it. But you know, the heritage uh, reviews of this, it doesn't cause substantial harm. There are other tall buildings in the area and it needs to be seen in the balance. And this is of that um, post war buildings, which half of the carbon of all of the buildings on the site. So uh, we love this top left. Uh, we're working on the building HSBC and moving back to the city for South Bank Parent, other uh, in Camden, but also a further field we went on MoMAR in the States and actually the, uh, 25 years ago to the World Bank in DC. Transforming existing carbons in new buildings is a really exciting thing to do. You don't have to knock it all down, but neither do you need to keep it look the same. So this just diagrammatically shows the red is the bit we remove and below is what happens in the office buildings and then office plans, which have really been shown. But the key thing to note is there's some big floor plates in there that you would never know about. And that will bring a different type of tenant to the borough. And it's absolutely impossible to tell from all of the views and all of the ways in which you experience the site. And I'm actually that there. And you can see we've really enjoyed lots of different people within the firm have designed uh, different buildings. And the same with the residential, taking back to the original listed or um, historic buildings, removing one shed to put in an affordable building on the right. And then that is a, a very beautiful and self-contained area. We didn't want to blur too much the critical um, employment mission and then all of the other benefits of very active uh, public realms. This shows the residential and how it just interlocks with the uh, office space and the building, the residential will form a, a kind of a palette that is that kind of oblique um, inherent of the architecture of the web terrace. Uh, the basements are limited in terms of how the site works. It's very, very dispersed in terms of other things, and there's a huge amount of urban green. So fantastic credentials. We're trying here to go to the aspirational or the recommended for Paris target um, targets here, nothing to do with planning minimums. Um, and please come back to that. So in essence, an amazing place for the community with the ability to bring fantastic jobs environmentally um, I think absolutely impeccable in terms of the embodied carbon and uh, operational carbon and the big thing for us is we've told very long to try and make a scheme that's also deliverable to bring the to the site. Thank you.
Thank you very much. And um, that's our presentation, Chair. Thank you. Um, with your permission, we'd just like to show the video quickly because we don't have the model available. Um, Victor's going to try and do that now. Okay. Just whilst he's doing that, we made reference to benefits. Um, I understand officers might have sent you the benefits packet. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah. we did print that off. I think everybody's got a copy. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think there's a copy to your right, Councillor. Yeah. On there. Do you have um, any uh, audio that we need to hear or? Uh, no, so we put it on silent. It's just music. Yeah. Right. It's just, okay. So you can talk. Music, around. is it uplifting? <laughs> Very uplifting. <laughs> uplifting. Yes. Play well, uplifting music now. It's on our website as well. So we can oh, it, so this is this is on your website is yeah. it as well. Yeah. But yes, this is it. So I can always circulate the band afterwards. Yeah. 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 And obviously, we could talk for this for hours because we have spent yeah. a, a very long time developing. Yeah, so I'm just uh, so the public realm you see in these images were characterized as being a little bit suburb, and so we are working on the way in which urban green is brought to these spaces. Right, so it's, no, it's not running particularly well. But... Okay. It's really clunky. It looks good on this. It's not. So like, mm, yeah. we, should we just <laughs> we watch on the video, on the website if you have the moment? Yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's all right here on this. Yeah, keep that going. The laptop. Mm. It's this is the best graphics I've ever seen. If, 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 in terms of the detail, it's fantastic. Just not running very smoothly here. Yeah. Sure. Is it the current version? Shows the different routes and your and the experience as you go into the site. The site. And we have continued working. There is more. We don't have a big model. Is that? Post this and post. Uh, uh, we've uh, changed the scheme. Continue to change the scheme. Yeah. We want to make it as good as is possible. Exactly. But this is not just showing the different yeah. routes. It's also about how different people experience the space and the different types of spaces for for different people. So that's and what's being addressed with some of these options. <laughs> Are these images of the current version? No, yes. this is one iteration old. Oh. Um, I mean, as you know, we've done a huge amount of design change since the last iteration design. Yeah. Panel, Which is so why the model's not here, isn't it? Correct. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's model's right. behind the work. Yeah. And that is, we've been working through the wire to make sure we incorporate as many parts as we can. Probably about the end, right? Yeah, so let's that, say that's extremely indicative. We're now working with a number of local artists to. This is the this is the urban room. Piano centre. Councillor Young. Video. <laughs> Probably it's a little bit rough already, but that was just to try and. Sorry, give you is that me coming off mute by mistake? Apologies. No, no I'm also uh, walking the dog. Thank you. That might be the end of our presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to note again that we not uh, we have Councillor Young and we also have Councillor Potter online. So I'll keep uh, both councillors. I'll keep an eye out for your hands if you can raise them when you want to um, say something. But otherwise, we'll go to questions. Councillor Desmond, chomping at the bit. Yeah. 
Can you pass me the? Uh, Chair, may, yeah. Give me. May I just make one request? Jane doesn't have long, and she she really needs to leave. Yeah. There's any chance that questions for her might be covered first? I know, I know she'd appreciate it. Yeah, that's fine. I, That'd be okay. That's fine. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, any questions? um for around sort of skills um exactly. um engagement employment with opportunities, people, employment opportunities yeah. engagement young people education those sorts of things yeah yes please if you wouldn't mind that would be incredibly helpful any questions on that from members yeah i i, I had one question on this you can see the slide that set out the anticipated number of jobs that would be created at each stage of the development and then subsequent to the development but I just wondered if you could give us a little bit more detail that works for Jane or for yourself about good people's role and sort of how developed the plans are. Do you have specific colleges or local organisations and so on in mind to be able to deliver these and then what's required in order to build the capacity to actually roll it out ahead of development and so on? Uh, I'd be happy to say that. Shall I slide it as well? Um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, We've been working with developers uh, for 12 years now. We have seven developments on uh, the go at the moment. Uh, the third one we worked with was the Shard in Southwark, where we uh, supported 447 uh, local unemployed residents into work, 78% uh, of whom were into 24, 82% of whom were people of colour and global integrity. Uh, and at 26 weeks, 78% of them were still in work. <laughs> We worked within uh, the supply chain for Shard, so facilities management, security, engineering, cleaning, FM. Uh, but we also worked with the tenants from the green at the top to the Shangri La, all the way through all the different tenants, which get everything from uh, Al Jazeera to Campari to Tiffany to Warwick Business School to hedge funds, ad agencies, tech, tech companies. And uh, I guess the point is it's possible to normalize uh, responsible business within the development. It's hard and it takes time, but I think we are getting to the point in, I guess, the cycle where more and more businesses are waking up to the need to be socially responsible. Uh, when I was school, what I was interested in was pay and the company car. Uh, now young people are want to understand the purpose uh, of the organisation. They want to understand how morally and socially responsible they are, which is informing much of their career choices. Uh, so that's the background. Uh, We've worked with a team here for 18 months. I can say that uh, the commitment to doing this properly, doing this well, is exemplary. I think that's as a result of it being a family business and then having a long term view. Uh, but we have worked smoothly and seamlessly with the team from the outset. I think, um, I think it's a form of patient capitalism, playing a long game. So we've spent six months. Uh, taking a co-design process with different partners across the borough. Uh, we mapped uh, over 40 different organisations and had conversations with many of them to start to identify the priorities. I think looking at the priorities uh, of the local authority, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing poverty in our communities uh, rampaging away. You know, the growth of civilian insecure work nationwide has grown by 21% last, uh, now stands at 21% nationwide. Uh, and I think that's probably uh, proportionally even higher. I think 48% of children in Hackney uh, are living beneath the poverty line once they've taken out housing costs as it stands. You all know that, of course. So I think, um, I think we have an opportunity here to uh, create Inga's empire. I think we have an opportunity for a developer to start to look to demonstrate how they can start to make an active contribution to the challenges that communities and local authorities face. And I think the local authorities facing a four billion pound deficit nationwide. Uh, I think uh, there's an opportunity here for us to all work together, lockstep with each other, to look at how this can shift to uh, can actually address their priorities. Uh, we have modelled extensively uh, the delivery team, uh, the outputs, we, uh, the targets are to place 508 people into jobs and end use and our apprenticeships during the construction phase. We're working with your uh, employment skills lead, Dujon Lee, uh, Dujon Khatabi, to be shaking that. And is that an aspiration or is that sort of is that, that big contractual? That'd be a contractual commitment, yeah. Okay. Um, and in addition to that, and this is going over and above the Section 106 obligation, we committed to supporting 1,500 of your young people into meaningful experiences that can demonstrably change their life chances. Per Jane's comments, 
we have to set our children up with networks and inspiration and hope. We have to look at how we prepare them as they move through the skills and education system. We give them access to these opportunities, help them feel welcome in these new environments. And it doesn't happen on its own. You know, we're at a stage where our educationists are dramatically under-resourced and have the capacity to do this. Uh, and developers have committed to investing into this over and above the sexual and sexual obligations with a demonstration of goodwill. But also, most importantly, these are things that we can embed into the development. You know, we want to make, we want to provide a turnkey ESG strategy or social value strategy so we can hide the wiring and make it really easy for businesses that are based in the developments to do the right thing. Honestly, most organizations are willing to do the right thing. They just need to be helped. We can set the bar really high, but we can't leave organizations to, to their own devices to work out the labyrinth of labyrinthine provision that exists at a local level. It doesn't happen. I think the, the, the evidence base amply bent that up. But I think if we embed this in and we work closely with you uh, uh, from now, moving forward throughout the life cycle of development, I think not only can we do can we hit these targets, but we can probably exceed them. We over-index by 50% on the shard. You problem. mentioned tenants at the shard and working with them as well. Is yeah. that is how mature are the plans for particular tenants? And have you been and will you be working with tenants? For this they are yeah. uh, uh -huh. we, we are going to be as that, that in-house on-site uh, a turnkey provider that just makes it really easy for them to do. And once we build that momentum, you normalize it. Uh, it just becomes something that all organizations do within development because you know you start to look a bit weird if you don't do it. It's early days when we've got one major occupier who will be interested in taking the main building and they are very socially responsible. It's early days. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you can't do anything without a planning consent. I think the absolute key message as well is this only comes with a comprehensive approach to the development. It, it just can't, it's not possible to deliver this at the scale that it needs to be delivered it, it, unless we get the, com the combined uh, whole package. Then can I just ask a follow-up on skills? Because um, obviously Hackney runs this sort of Hackney Works um, program as well, and is that is that integrated into into your approach as well? Uh, I think looking at um, so uh, as an example of how we sort of will, will work in this manner. I mean, Jane and I are working together on something called Southwark Works. We've been uh, retained by Southwark Council for five years to help them deliver their economic development strategy, and that is around our engagement. Um, jobs across the borough uh, within anchor organizations within the supply chain of Southwark uh, you know spending over a billion pounds a year so you know we should be unlocking these jobs and their suppliers these suppliers are willing to provide jobs to local people but they just need to know how so the work we do very happily interfaces into that existing provision that's done at works and Southwark Council refer developers to us uh, to help them shape their section 106 strategies and we then work back through Southern works to help deliver it. So this isn't about displacing what happens at Hackney Works. This is being this is additive. Uh, and I don't think the two things are mutually exclusive. I think you know, we, we need to look at how we collaborate better across sectoral boundaries. You know, like us can be really helping the delivery of your own teams rather than competing with them. So right. it's a, 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 a yeah, very complementary. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Potter, um, is your hand raised on the basis of skills and employment opportunities? Um, yes. Right, go on, ask your question then. Thank you. Um, just to follow on the skill side of things, um, I know quite a lot of the time, I mean, it sounds like there's some great commitment to skills. Um, you know, the partnership working you've described sounds very exciting. In my experience with skills, quite a lot of the time, a lot of the placements and support for young people breaks down because it ends up being the subcontractor um, who, who often, you know, um, provides that training and support and mentoring to the young person, and often their commitment is very, very different. So how how are you going to ensure that those placements are quality and that any subcontractors that you use will share that same commitment? Great, thank you, Councillor Bottom. Yeah, that is a fantastic question, and and actually is the question as far as uh, certainly within the construction roles are concerned. The developers uh, engage us to help make sure that their commitments are followed through with. Because you're absolutely right. Uh, honestly, a lot of the prime contractors will deliver, will promise the moon on a stick in terms of the jobs they'll deliver. But by the time that gets passed down that complex supply chain, that commitment has become so abstract to the way it's meaningless. So the key to making that work is to embed that commitment into the tendering process when we actually embed a contractor. We make them accountable for it. We make them contractually uh, uh, contractually. Uh, uh, um, 
committed to liver and but we then manage that relationship and it, it's similar to what i said earlier organizations will do the right thing but they have to be given the support also often they're asked to make commitments to local jobs for local people but then we leave it to their own devices to work out how they actually operate operationalize that and deliver it and it doesn't work it just doesn't work i think you, i don't you know i wouldn't want to put words in anyone's mouth but for most local authorities it doesn't work but i think we can manage it and we can do a good job uh, provided we get the, the commission process right great okay thanks very much do you want to say anything or uh, just to add to uh rich's point really when once a student is in pl on placement it's really hard for the college to be everything to all of those stakeholders and when we do go into challenging times because we're dealing with young people or adults that are new to professional settings we have good people to go to and they can help us navigate that space to ensure that our students have the absolute best opportunities that developments like this will afford our you know our local residents which would be amazing for the colleges to play their part in a new city college has already been mentioned one thing i think is worth noting is that the association of colleges and particularly the london principals forum is very strong and these developments are exactly the the part that anchor institutions such as colleges want to play a big role in in order to open the door to all of their stakeholders so you know very best with all of it really i suppose Great. Thank you. thanks very much thank you thank, thank you for joining us great let's move on in that case so i had councillor desmond um first uh, yeah well firstly um i didn't actually know Larry bard who was the founder of the bard family and was a great pioneer in shoreditch he's sadly dead now so i would like it Note as a non pecuniary interest, as they said, was no longer alive. But he had a great foresight about what shortage could be when really it was extremely run down. What we want to see is pioneers like that continuing and with enthusiasm doing his work in the air. And I hope this will be an example. Um, I wanted to ask two questions. Firstly, I'm quite concerned about the, the glass cities we see at Canary Wharf and we see at Surrey Docks and part of Liverpool Street. From what I can see, the architecture is going to be varied and fit for purpose, and you're keeping a number of original structures. So do convince us that we're not going to go there and just see glass, point one. And two, well, three things actually. The second thing is you've seen all the slight technical problems we've had here. What techno technological infrastructure are you going to put in there to encourage high tech companies? And there are many in the shortage area, Silicon uh, roundabout and want to be there, what are you able to put in to make it interesting for those of the words? And thirdly, for the smaller businesses, what sort of contracts will you offer them to rent or lease property? Will it be for repairing and insuring contracts and will the terms be reasonably favourable because obviously the cost of development can be quite high and we want small companies to be able to go there as acorns of the common over dreams. Thank you. Can I take that first part? Yep. So firstly, I'm got a bit emotional then. Um, so well done. So um, uh, Roy Barnes, my friend, and his daughter is online. Sarah, oh, who's, who is the looks after the family business now. Sarah's unfortunately ill tonight, so she can't be here. But you're absolutely right. Roy was fantastic. He he was a beacon for Shoreditch, and he has changed Shoreditch. So we're absolutely on message. The family exists about both families, SMEs key to what they do so smes will be cherished the idea of this is the the point of we have the full life cycle shortage is an open air exchange you can have one desk or you can be have a very large company and both can be accommodated by our plans so we have a range of floor plates a range of pricing a range of specifications what we need is one superior building that attracts a key tenant that key tenant wants to be carbon zero platinum scored it's all about the pursuit of talent. You have to get the best talent. That talent wants to write for the wants to work for the right business that's completely ESG'd up to the hilt. So we need to deliver the best building that will attract the best tech occupier. We know all about that. So we're we're right on it. Um, so SMEs, yes, we will have flexible workspace. So in and out relatively easily. We'll also have to be underpinned by a large scale transaction as well. Absolutely on message with what you've said. Good. 
and part of that for us is the idea you can grow up in the site, so there are plenty of different places there. Um, the site's blessed with a lot of uh, electrical infrastructure, big, huge substations, so we start as a position of strength. Um, and of course, we'll look at um, every way in which we can enable um, technology to, to work in these buildings. I mean, I think what's interesting is that's after the very big fundamentals, not very difficult. In fact, it's helping simplify the buildings. And if we were to caricature things, we've gone from highly specific buildings, only good for banking or whatever in Canary Wharf, to latter-day warehouses again, which were such a very um, flexible typology. So we hope we are rebuilding modern warehouses, also built very simply, built with low carbon and built to last. So um, I think it's interesting, I mean, the, 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 the Canary Wharf discussion at the moment is that they were all built at a similar era and they all have some peculiarities of how they were put together. Um, and here there's obviously an invitation to have very uh, much more window wall buildings, lots of insulation, lots of good proportion. Um, we'll, we'll use technology and glass enough to get fantastic light and proportion, but not to, um, to, to any excess. And we believe that actually we are improving this conservation area by moving the, that architecture to that. And we've done similar projects, for instance, in Covent Garden and various other places. So they're very respectful of traditional materials and approach, but you can tell that they're modern. And if you want to add anything more about infrastructure, uh, look, I think one really good thing that's going to be is is the decarbonisation, particularly for the residential properties. <clears throat> we're going to be getting rid of all the gas, and um, we're going to be installing a district heat network, uh, which is fully electrified. Um, what it does is it basically pumps hot water around to all of the flats, which then inside the flats they have a, a box which is about the size of a boiler. It's got a heat exchange, so it's a sort of a separate system. That, the resident has a leak on their system, it doesn't drain the whole system, um, but it is it is fully decarbon, excuse me, uh, very efficient. And, and the best thing about it, I think, is there's now, the government's brought on board a, a basically a regulation of these systems. So it's dealing with the, you get manufacturers who will come along and they will take over ownership of the network. Bills get paid and it's fully regulated. So um, the consumers, the residents, will will be dealing a bit like with dealing with a utility company. So you've got all the consumer protection, um, and I just think it's a it's a it's a it's a much better system now than some of the ones that have been trialled in the past. Just a quick point, if I may, just on your tenants um, question. Um, one of the philosophies behind what we're doing is that a small single person startup incubator SME style business can come in, get supported, and grow. And as their business grows in terms of its scale, the number of people it employs they can move around the development into bigger space, more tailored space, bigger floor plates. So potentially you can go from a single person company to something quite significant without leaving this part of Cure. Anyone on the site at the moment has seen yeah. 30 different businesses at the moment. Yeah. Um, they will be consulted. Uh, as a property manager, the last thing we want to do is lose our tenants. Yeah. It's very expensive to lose tenants. So we will be working our hardest to try and retain everyone. And hopefully some of them are, are already acorns growing into pretty big oak trees anyway. So they could be the pre lap tenant. Yeah. You know, watch this space. Thank you. And, and the house, the, the new residential will be passive, passive house, excuse me, which implies a stability in as well. Okay. Great. Um, don't see any hands at the moment, but I'll kick off with the elephant in the room, which is the tower, obviously, which I think we've obliquely sort of referenced um, a couple of times so far. So, um, from your perspective, obviously, the uh, the tower is an integral part of the um, of the site and makes it possible. Obviously, the conservation area is is um, the policy is heading in the opposite direction, essentially, for towers are within the conservation area. Now, admittedly, it's also central activity zone is also a um, uh priority office area so what's uh, wh why are we having why is that tower there what, what what's your reason behind the, the kind of quite substantial tower there just to in interject i think howard it might be worth you dealing with this sort of market economic point and then john you're going to look at it from a towns townscape perspective and i might come in at the end to talk about heritage that might be very dirty yeah so uh, one of the problems that you have in in real estate is Clearly, it has to be um, viability to make a scheme work. And we have got a high existing use value. The building's got sites on it, the buildings on it at the moment. We have to, to deliver all of these packages, we have to generate value. Um, we've only got one large building, which is building, building A. That's the building of scale, 
Um, we've looked at this very, very carefully because in an urban environment, you, you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs. So clearly there will be some harm, but it's not substantial harm. And we, we believe on balance, our scheme, the benefits far outweigh the harm. We have to have one large building that generates sufficient money, is able to be pre-let, because you can't build a building of that size on spec. The, the council faced the same issue with uh, principal place, where we had to secure Amazon. You can then build these buildings. That will be the catalyst to make this whole, whole scheme work. You need a relatively large floor plate. It's got to be um, the best building. Then it's it's you, you can achieve a decent rent, and then the whole scheme works. It, it has to be building without compromise. If we don't get, we've already come down about 200,000 square feet from our initial proposals. So we are now at the absolute minimum that makes this scheme work. And we believe that um, the way that we've designed the building, we've got such a brilliant architect, we've designed a large building, but you actually cannot see from street level, the bulk is, I think perhaps you could talk about the, the design and how this building works. Mm. So I think what we wanted to do is to see if we could make the conservation area better, but also for the site to really punch its weight in terms of its location. It's an incredibly rare opportunity and it's in a strategic location. Um, but also we can do a building that would never be in the city. So this building is for Hackney, it's completely different. It is entirely informed by the typologies and the DNA of the borough. So the idea would be to make sure within our offer, there's something that attracts uh, a very um, a, a, a bigger organization, that could be a tech organization or, or a creative one, who would feel at home, the placemaking is good, they're very, very, very um, much now critical about what do they want to take as space. So it would take all of those things. So what we um, wanted to do is to enhance the conservation area, starting from this being the the most uh, kind of um, damaged and incomplete part of a larger conservation area. So we think it's very specific to this part of the conservation area and would not necessarily apply to most of the rest of it. And there's a lot of bomb damage in this particular area. There's a lot of open space, so it's not working at its full potential. So as we uh, I, I rush through it, but we're repairing the very clear definition of the scale of the conservation area as it's experienced all the way around its perimeter. Um, and, and that, I think, will help. At the moment, it's very chaotic and there's lots of older buildings. So you will immediately understand the first of the purposes were to understand you're leaving the city and going into a different borough. And, and in some ways, why that's why the conservation areas are in the areas they are. So that we understood completely and that will be very clear. We've left the city, the architecture, the scale, the, the granularity. It, it, it's a very, we've not simplified anything. Everything is still of the complexity that you'd imagine from schemes of a there are many, many years. So that is done, the place has opened up, and then we spent you know, over a year on the exact detail of that building to still provide the different type of space, but to respect every single of the local views. It's not in any of the longer heritage views, not at all. Um, and not really in the local view. So it gets to be a building that's kind of very finely poised. It feels very much as is a composition from the buildings around it. It is slightly bigger, but we believe that it's absolutely in the only place it could be in that whole wider area and very, very carefully done. Uh, I know there's a difference between conservation areas and design review panels, but both design panels understood that ambition and, and asked us to do uh, to calm it down a little bit, to, to amend and to create something really digitally, like it's a warehouse that happened to be bigger, and also to make sure that the rest of the building for uh, reinforcing that idea that it's new warehouses and old warehouses. Um, and so if you go through it, we, we went through them very quickly, but um, there is no view in which there's something to say, wow, um, and uh, there are lots of benefits to having that range of floor plates. But I think it goes back to we think it's an incredibly rare site. It's in a kind of transition zone between uh, the city and the conservation area. If you look even at the geometry of the, of the kind of the bigger buildings, which are set up by the LVMS, et cetera, there's an overlap. So, so many overlaps. We thought it would be a shame not to try and see whether it could both be a conservation area that is improved and provide a bit of quantum or type of space. So I think we set ourselves a difficult task. We think we've tried it incredibly hard to do that. And we think 
also that it's exemplary in, in heritage, in keeping the respect of people, and in having a group of people who translate kind of fine ideas into actual specific def defined things that will be in section 106 with groups who have track record in doing that. So the whole package is something to say, well, let's make the best of this site. Um, and let's make sure that Hackney makes the best of this site for the borough in terms of its uh, business rates and its employment prospects right next to the city. So all of those things, an optimization. I would say this is not a maximization scheme. And, and again, so maximization is, is old money in Canary Wharf. This this is not a maximization scheme. This is an optimization scheme. Well, this this is a this is a scheme that's put together by by an established uh, landowner who understands what shortage is about. So, I mean, I I, I I walk past this site every day. I'm getting old now. You, you get groups of people outside the Philip Webb terraces. This is a beacon for Hackney. What we're doing is putting that back to as it should be. We bought a building that we didn't own. We've completed the acquisition of the terrace. We're going to make the setting of the terrace brilliant. This will be tourist route. We've got the stage coming forward, the Curtain Theatre. We've got to be proud of what Hackney's got to what we want. We want the tourist economy. We want that strong. This is going to reinforce it. And we are removing a lot of the ad hoc additions around the web terrace. So all, all of that, I mean, there's a lot of taking away to make things better in this project. And we took off all the extensions all the way along Curtin Road and just other parts. So the historic buildings can be seen as their kind of intended entities. And my final part, I'm sorry, I'd like to have the final word. This, that all comes at a cost. So you have to have the economic drivers to make it work. Um, um, may I just... That, there's a lot to take in and that. Is of that big building very open, so that big transformable space, I think, will be extraordinary. Um, and that's the that's the open space in the, the, other, the, other, the room. other room. Yeah, and that's with a double height. It's uh, the half of the footprint of the building. It can be open or blocked. So in summer, it's working with the exterior. In winter, there's still a big place to go to. Um, and then again, we would expect that there's some discussion about how there are obligations to make sure that that is, is curated and with long-term owners, some good the hope it will happen. That's we, on my list, so that can come next. We do have, because you, you've asked the person in question, it's one of the key discussions we've been having with officers through pre yeah. with, There were two more points I know we wanted to make. If, we, if we've not thrown too much information in that answer already, could, I think you just want to make yeah, a quick I think point. It's just, just important to say about you know, the sense of place and so, you heard at the beginning we mentioned this idea of regenerative business hub and and that is a, a principle which is this is supposed to be a flagship scheme and, and that type, that is something which brings together commercial creative civic and community uses but with a very strong focus on sustainability um, and that that commitment and to those sustainable businesses isn't just something we're just trying to say oh you're going to see this when when it comes forward we've actually been working um, a lot with uh, green lab who are a company that specialize in kind of innovation and uh, sustainable um uh, business to look at actual meanwhile so how do we actually embed this in shoreditch from 2024 move, moving forward and that is you know where we're looking at partners from education um, to creative, to startups, dealing in looking at things like food, waste, fashion, um, a, ho a whole range. And, and that is really about cementing and, and creating um, that true destination to sort of set Hackney apart. That is something that is unique and not happening in Rhodes. And, and Chair, we've not touched on uh, policy, planning policies. I just wanted to quickly do that. So, I mean, this is a city fringe location. It's in the CAS. Um, it's also the priority office area. I don't think we've said this is also within the cover zone opportunity area planning framework. And the quantum of floor space we're proposing does actually align with the site allocation, which is in your site allocations local plan that was adopted back in 2016. And our position is this, which is really you should be optimizing development on brownfield sites and directing development to those sites that are most successful. And this is one of those sites. Thank you. Um, Councillor Potter, did you want to come in on the this particular part? Um, I'm sorry, kind of, yeah. Um, sorry if, if it's not directly relevant to Go this ahead. section. Um, I suppose I, I've heard you talk about this, the sustainability credentials which seem very impressive and also the place, the place making. I'm quite into this concept of Hackney's first regenerative business hub what that's going to quite mean and look like so 
um i mean i've heard the way that you've you know you've described it i'm quite keen to understand from officers whether you would term that in the same kind of way um could you ask that last bit again please um i'm hearing this scheme described as hackney's first regenerative business hub and i suppose what i want to understand from officers you know hackney sorry i can't see people very well <laughs> um i just want to know whether you'd also describe this scheme in the same way is it hackney's first regenerative business hub I'm not entirely familiar with the the, the terminology it's an employment-led scheme with a lot of office space that also has ground floor active uses and some residential if that's helpful i mean we we can try and explain the concept a bit better would that help the councillor um yeah okay I, I don't want to take over the meeting too much but it's just being presented as, as a fact and i just wanted to get the sense from our officers whether they see the term in the same way as your describing but i'm also hearing that it's you know it's a marketing tool as well so yeah so that somewhere in between i'm sure go on yeah. let's, get, <laughs> so, let's get someone's response to this okay. i don't think it's one for officers i think it's one for you to sort so, of talk. So it's not a marketing tool um and i think the the key point here is that this is something which has been st started and embedded since day one and it's about you come you you, you look at the history and the heritage of the site, and that is looking at about craft. It celebrates kind of the, the making and, and the history of Shoreditch. And we know that with all the challenges that are, are happening in the world, how the, the economy is changing, how kind of people's interests and sort of ESG, we need to create a proper place. This isn't just a sort of regular office building scheme like Nick is describing. It's about cementing and creating a flagship destination with an ideology and a brand embedded from day one. And that and that comes through from the, the tenants. It comes through with the partners that, that you work with. Um, and you know, it will be it will set it apart from anything else. And and that is should not be underestimated. Can I just um, finish on the tower and then come, over, yeah. come to you, Ed? Sorry. So I think, um, thanks for the explanation of the tower, obviously. Um, I think we haven't sort of seen probably the vernacular and the sort of design of that yet, because that's, that's sort of slightly less designed, is that right, at the moment? Um, yeah. How it'll look and how it'll feel. We've got a sort of block it's, model, basically. But um, I, we, we have worked through the design. It might be worth going back to some of the images that we Tell me what page. Um, because um, I think the 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 sort of typologies that you've sort of um, expressed for some of the small buildings look, I think, um, yeah, it seems to be very attractive. You know, use the materials we'd want to see glazed bricks, something like that kind of thing. Yes, well, obviously we need to the, to the, the um, if we look at the office section, I'm afraid I don't have. Go through the document too. There's a bit with the carbons kept and then the ground and the office floor place and then some images of the office building. So the office building. You so, try and find it. Yeah, they, 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 effect, effectively, they are using materials of warehouse, brick, faience, terracotta. We like the idea of glass block being brought in because it's a modern version of industrial. And we try to use that where it's making the second to the basic building next to the top and that was a nice sort of play of old and new materials. So you'll know that it's a, a working of a, a modern um building. Um you want to do uh, yeah, one one important thing is that the building it grows from the street gradually. So it's not really landing straight to the facade, you know, like a cliff down on Curtain Road. Uh, the building picks up the datum existing Portal Road, which is four or five stories. And then from that, it sort of highlights the address, um, it can a recognizable address entrance through the site. And then it climbs like in gradual steps to, you know, to the, basically the height of the maximum height of the volume. Um, so it is, it is literally like in its essence, the ways it is conceptualized. 
it is coming from below, it's not landing it's from above. It's growing out of the floor. Yeah. It's so growing within the site itself, landing from above, which is the example that you, you made about some of the buildings and kind of work in the city, which is an entirely different process. I don't know if you can find that page. But what's the page? I think you can try page 48. Is it page 48? Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, so on page 48, um, and perhaps zoom in on the top left image. <laughs> So I don't have the page number. Uh, I'm looking at it. Um, yep, looks yeah. like it. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So the, the first the first aspect is that the, the larger floor plates are actually the things that help us define the um the day terminal on Curtain Road mm -hmm. and then they step back significantly from Curtain Road. And then if you can see the building, it has certain corners which really reduce how heavy it feels. Yeah. So it's a, uh, I don't know if there's a kind of a sort of evolution of industrial buildings through 30s and different, different areas. So it has open corners, a light brick, um, some areas of, of glass uh, and we we're looking at a kind of a new all type of which we hope is original, um, which effectively brings in something other than, than the brick or terracotta, but is very much similar as industrial. If you then look at the view below where the Evan room is, you'll see I think that very much feels it's both glass block, but also Victorian um, the, the kind of blue terracotta. So we're, we're trying to kind of draw inspiration from what we think are some of the really nice aspects of commercial buildings of several eras of the past and, and have that in the architectural building. So there's both a very, very long sort of process that it's not just the massive view, we looked in every single view, this is a very calm and responsive view. Mm -hmm. We try to make sure that it doesn't present a wide face in any of the views. Um, it, it doesn't kind of aggregate to something, the composition breaks it down. It always steps back in the view. So if we went to the view stud of fantastic. So yeah, we have this way to the this is actually quite an expensive architectural treatment because the easy way is the glass and the glass and steel curtain awning system, which are not very good for U values or sustainability. This is expensive to create, but it is off shortage. And that, that's why we've gone for it. So that's the overall architecture. Then if we were to look at the townscape views more. Um, it always steps back and away from any of the local views down the street. So it, it, it's always uh, very much recessive and the base and the, the middle and the top slightly different treatment. So um, I guess if we went back to there's probably... I think around page 35. I mean, I can, I can share instead. Yeah, sorry. I think that's quite easy. Uh, I can I can share the document too. Okay, sure. Yeah. So this is aimed at trying to show first of all the kind of the character of so the right is how it carefully uh, defines the pen road scale. But actually itself just comes to the front so that the building is in between the cone retained warehouse and building B, which is of a different architecture. So it just pushes to the front um, and then steps back. The middle view is to show then that kind of uh, I think at that level would be really interesting because the, the building's slightly glowed, you know, is within that that urban space there's some nice activity and you could see things in the evening and then really beautiful during the day. And the left hand side shows the um, the way in which we have to very carefully with warehouse language and typologies and proportions and, and <laughs> bills, etc., to create a building which is a composition, which is definitely the part of the language of warehouses. And um, one of the things that we've tried to do is to try and make sure that it's not too complicated. Um, and again, that's something to really align with the typologies there. So it's taken a long time to get to that phase. But if then for instance um so we look in the in the middle bottom view which was highlighted in the earlier presentation you can see that the composition allows it to pull away so there's basically no block to the view as you're looking down luke street um it's very much merging with the the kind of townscape of the buildings in the foreground 
Um, and to the left on Paul Street, you can see that actually you can see the stage beyond. So it's not actually changing. You can see buildings at the end of Paul Street and we're carefully doing a composition of the step of the bank. Um, and then I think you'll see in the other views here that it really doesn't use. So wherever it is seen on those, let's say, middle distance views, it steps back. You've gone to the bigger page. So when we started, we were visible on artillery fields and all sorts of other places, all removed over a period of time. And just to explain, there was a, a more of a discussion about whether it had a dialogue with some of the other buildings. And the answer is no. So it's definitely kind of become just of its conservation area and of its place. Um, and I think that simplified a large number of the impacts. And then here, um, the other place that you see it in dialogue with anything else is as you're coming from Great Eastern Street at the very top of Curtin Road. And at that point is where you do also see the buildings from the city, which are on the left hand side. There's just that one location. If you look at the top again, you will see it's always something that. Um, is not a block, which is exactly you know, where it is. It's a composition. It gets a lot smaller as it gets higher. So this steps back and steps back and steps back. So this is not an, in any remote way a, an extrusion. It's just about the idea that there are some bigger, medium, and smaller plates that are uh, more modern and as enough from the warehouses. So this so is not trying to be a greedy building. It's just going to be something that's got a presence and brings an extra component to this complex site. Just to add a sentence, if I may, that the Hackney Design Review Panel feedback, which is very useful to us and is why we've been changing the scheme, did say that um, this tallest building in views from further away, the building worked well, was respect for the conservation area being largely hidden from view. So, okay. um, I know Councillor Young's on, but I've got some people waiting that have been waiting a while. Councillor Young, are you coming in specifically on the tower or can I add to you, in fact, you've just gone? Can it's on you? the tower. I'm here. Go on, then. On Go the on then. Yeah. Is that all right? Yeah. Um, so forgive me because I was walking before and I might have missed the answer to this. If um, it, it, would a one word answer to why we need the tower be viability was my first question. Um, and the second one was to officers. And again, you might have already covered this. Um, if we have if we allow this tower, will that mean that then there's a precedent? And so we'll have to allow other towers nearby so, i mean i'll give the architect's answer then should hear the client's answer second one first note we have absolutely believed that this is not precedent there are maybe one or two other um discussions about towers but this is a large site with an opportunity to provide something that's slightly taller um it's, it's not it's not a tower in the sense of an extrusion it's actually more a compositional building um it's it, it, it's a very rare opportunity to have such a big site that one has the flexibility to get to the point where this is located so sensitively um and i believe that the real driver for it is to provide a range of different types of space yeah. in this large site in order to have a set of different types of tenant and to attract some of larger tenants which will be something that is very unusual um for the barrack and if I could just chip in, excuse me, for the one word answer, we wouldn't use viability, but we would, we would use deliverability, which we think is a bit more uh, all encompassing and holistic as to the challenges and constraints you have to look at when you're dealing with a site of this complexity. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Young. All right, um, bring in um, Councillor Narcross, um, then Councillor Sadek, then Councillor Webb. Um, so yeah, my, my question was also well, one of them what was on the tower as well. Um, so just kind of going going through the document, am I right in thinking that kind of the main sort of issues are still sort of the, the heritage impact of some of those sort of buildings? Um, and obviously, there's been a lot of discussion that's brought the tower down on size, but sort of bigger in, in footprint. Um, and I just wanted to get kind of officers views on on sort of how far away from where you'd like to see that potentially um, are we at the moment? We've been in negotiation for quite a while now, and this essential massing of the tower has remained the same for quite a while, despite all the conversations that we've had about it. Um, as to where it would need to get to, the site allocation suggests uh, taller builds in the centre up to 12 storeys. This is 19, but we are obviously looking at a particular site and a particular design, skillful architect. So where it gets to, um it, we kind of we'll know it when we see it if you see what i mean but um we are definitely um 
interested in further conversations rather than perhaps the early submission that we see. Okay, Councillor Sadek. Did you have more questions? Uh, you got me and not yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to probe the point that Councillor Potter made um, about this being a regener regenerative development that supports sort of regenerative economy in the area. The, the way that you described it um, sounded um, that it was, you meant it in the sense primarily about making sort of good and improved use of um, an existing site with sort of respect to the heritage of the site and the idiosyncrasies of the, the community and the area and so on, which is brilliant. But the term is used a lot on slide 25 with reference to sustainability. Um, and I just wonder if you could, if it's intent, if you were intending also to refer to it in that way, this is the green lab slide. Um, and then it's sort of appended to that question. It's just, I, I, I can't see anything concrete in this slide about what Green Lab does or what they're saying they'll do in relation to this development. So I just wondered if someone could speak to that point, anything concrete or specific that they'll be doing to, to deliver on what seem quite sort of high level um, aspirations in the slide. So I don't know if, if you're able to talk to Green Lab, that might be helpful because I know Rich can come in as well. So if you don't mind. So Green Lab is a, is a enterprise which focuses on green and sustainable in working with green and sustainable innovative businesses and they have seeded businesses and um who have, who have grown and they partner with a lot of startup businesses who very much have that kind of green agenda so some of the companies that they've worked with for instance there's a company around um creating zero um healthy kind of paint as, as a simple example right which doesn't have a lot of the petrochemicals in that the normal paint would have there's um, a lot of companies that have worked with around food and how to reduce reduce waste um so how that is embedded is that we sort of see it as green lab is kind of large part of the social value element and it's about how you how you create social value but combine it with cultural innovation and the way we're going to kind of commit to that, and it doesn't seem so high level in terms of answering your, your question, is that you know, we're, we're envisaging that there's real spaces in this scheme for those businesses to come in. And so that would be at both, it could be at ground floor, it could be at first floor, um, and it will be you know, part of the whole affordable workspace offer that it, that it represents. So it, it it's very much there from day, from, day, from, day, from day one when the scheme's delivered, but it's actually there from day one now because as i sort of referenced we've got this meanwhile strategy where we're going to be taking things forward from now to the point of the scheme being delivered and that is to get those partners embedded and engaged early and it's also to get other businesses to realize what the opportunity is and how we can actually support them bring them um keep them i should say actually in hackney to sort of stop the talent drain which has been happening of businesses leaving to newham to islington and to tower hamlets um so it's it's about having the right mindset and the right direction from day one so i hope that answers can i just keep in as well so we were introduced to green labs by um, a lady called yasmin uh, henry jones who uh, was previously at one of our tenant companies, a company called Ing Media. And that's another story as well. Ing Media have been in, on the site. They've been tenants of ours in different parts of the property for 20, over 20 years. They, they've, they've got a, a great business there and they now employ, I think it's about 50 or 60 people on the site. So they specialize in this kind of initiative. Yasmin is a specialist, she's XFT and she's a specialist now in placemaking. She's actually gone off to do her own thing. She's now leading, um, the, the place making at Labby 20 on the Olympic Park and she's going to continue to consult with us but she put us together with Green Lab um, they're a fantastic business uh, Mark Shaler he's a published author he's a, he's a renowned expert on sustainable initiatives so I'd highly recommend we can provide you his books um, really interesting no really genuinely interesting guy um, these are the, the, it's new it, it, it's a bit disappointing that Nick hasn't really kind of talked to us about it because it's 
unfortunately, is we, we have struggled to explain some of the things because it's not seen, it sits outside policy, so we get that. But it's a fantastic concept. We would just welcome a bit more time to explain it with, with the people. Uh, unfortunately, Yasmin couldn't be here. She's also hit by the same bug, but uh, it seems like, but she would happily as well explain the situation. I think what we don't want to create is a sterile, boring office campus. <laughs> That's an over to everyone. We celebrate Hackney. Hackney is a place for makers. This is all bed manning makers around here, furniture makers, creative industries. We've got 44,000 square feet of affordable workspace. That's an enormous contribution to the local economy. And we're not going to fill it with boring people doing boring stuff. We're, on, we're absolutely our message is we have got to curate. We will keep control of that ground floor plane. We've learned how you curate space. You have to poly We want to. This this site will be judged by more people going in at night than coming out during the day. You have to make it a vibrant place. We've spent a lot of time on this. We will create it and we will deliver it for you. If we still have time, I think Rich. I, if you if you permit the time, I think Rich just wants to say something as well to answer your question. Sure. Yeah, I just like to offer a little frame. I think um, if we look around and look at how quickly the the conversation around green has mainstreamed and just in a small number of years we've gone from this being a bit of a fringe consideration to something that is you know, very much part of the news cycle day by day. So I think what we're seeing is business is shifting quickly and I think just to offer a sort of frame around this notion of a regenerative business hub, we're moving from business being fundamentally about the profit, you know, it's Milton Friedman, the purpose of business is purely profit, everything else is just an externality and nothing matters. We're shifting from that being the sort of prevailing wisdom to uh, 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 an idea of doing no harm being the next stage of the journey. You know, let's just not mess everything up and destroy the planet. I think we're moving quickly is towards the notion of regenerative business. We're not, and it, not only do we not do harm, but we actually look at how we start to heal and repair our communities, biodiversity, the, uh, 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 the systems of which we are. So I think. That's what we mean by regenerative business. It's about starting to practically lean into how do we do better? How do we embed circularity into every single thing that we do on the site? How do we procure locally? Uh, how do we make sure that we're delivering inclusive growth and capturing the value that's being created with local suppliers? How do we make sure that the food being easily is, you know, we're keeping down the food miles? How do we recycle, radically recycle and repurpose and recycle uh, uh, everything that we're using on the site? And just embedding that as a philosophy. Why? Because it's the right thing to do, but B, because it's actually attractive to future tenants. These are the types of environments that people want to work in. You know, this, this is just, you know, I think where the agenda is heading. So, you know, there's as much of this is about being sustainable. Yes, it is about marketing because that's, I think, where the world's coming. We want to be ahead of that and make sure that we're there for that. So we, want, we also need, um, with respect, we, 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 we need to make this commercial. No, don't want to waste anyone's time. We want to deliver this scheme. It has to be commercially viable. And what we've done is we've kept all of the heritage properties. We are restoring listed properties. Others would have tried to take away some of these buildings locally. We are not. We're keeping them all. We've actually identified a building we, which was not even on any list, and we're going to uh, enhance it. We're delivering a, a, a really creative muse for the residential side of things. Um, these benefits will be part of the 106, so we'll be, we'll be absolutely now to the mast on delivering this. Um, that has to be paid for, and that's why we know that the scheme, building A, is big. We know it is, but within the context of the benefits that the scheme delivers, there's some harm, but it's it's far outweighed by the good. We have to get a certain amount of square footage to get us over the existing use of it. No point. It's, 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 I think it's, this is the main site in your whole local plan. You don't get a four and a half acre site like this. So the fact we can deliver comprehensive benefits is a wonderful opportunity for us all. And can I just ask, um, just to follow up to that in terms of sustainability, have you considered any of your smaller buildings being um, de uh, developed using sort of innovative sort of uh, materials, so cross laminated timber, other sort of materials that aren't sort of concrete based? We're going through building by building, so every single building has had a range of different versions of the structure with a measure of the carbon. And um, so, so yes, we're, we're looking at a, a range of possibilities. Obviously, the first step is to keep the carbon. 
Um, the second one is to figure out the best way to. So for every building, we do have options on on how approaching it. Because you still got. It looks like you still got something like forty thousand tons of up to, upfront car at the moment. Um, in terms of the, on the and, on, uh, in in terms of um, the new development would generate in excess of around forty thousand tons of upfront carbon. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. The most important thing here, though, is this isn't even being driven by regulation. This is being driven by the market and the kind of tenants who want to who who can afford to rent this kind of space. They are demanding it, and that we will. There's no nothing less sustainable than a building that doesn't have a tenant. Yeah. Yeah. This sits empty. So we just have to deliver it. What's the market demands? Right. Yeah. So I mean, work in progress is the answer to that. But sorry, the, the number you you quoted is from from the report. Sorry. So forty thousand four hundred fifty-eight uh, plus so, these zeros for the, kilos. Had, um, I mean, clearly now. Uh, hopefully, we, we I'm missing. We're going through each building. And, and each typology to get to a, a, the lowest carbon answer we can. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can I just ask about the public space? Um, what do you mean by public space? Um, would it be public public space? Is it managed public space that's private, or what's the what would? It's it entirely open twenty four seven. Okay. Oh, it's not gated. If, if not gated, if you have a question. No, we're gated. Um, we the invitation to dwell without paying for anything. So um, we have at the moment some the classes to, um, who are looking at interesting uh, seating, etc. Uh, to keep it flexible, um, we think it's sort of more urban than, than not. And in fact, the reviews said they thought it felt a little bit nostalgic to have to have a little tufts of grass over here. So it's basically a yard with trees and seating that allows a flexible use of things to spill in and out of it. This is entirely open all the time. Mm -hmm. And then the urban room, well, uh, it sounds great. What would be the management of that? How, how would you envisage that working? So we've, so the, there's, will be, there's a cultural program for the scheme. Um, and that cultural program works with the community. So there's different community groups, whether it's colleges, whether it's different charities, interest groups. But then there's also kind of the management of the site and um, so that could be events, it could be artists, it, um, art, art gallery exhibitions, it could be school plays, it could be fashion, um, it could, there will be a whole variety of events that, that can be held in that space. And that will be coupled with that during the day, you know, in the summer, that whole space can be open and people can from at any time of the day sit there, whether it's have lunch or just, or just pass through, um, and it will become a very active eventual space and that's a unique offer in my terms that's a unique offer for Shoreditch we we same group we delivered the first pocket park as part of the stage we know what we, we know about the benefits that helps you attract tenants so we've put a pocket park into Shoreditch uh, the fact that this urban room of 10,000 square feet will be available for the community use is game-changing and again so we we think this is an amazing idea so obviously we're trying it um, to, to establish this as an idea, and you can see in Vancouver, which is an interesting city, they have a planning this and they're blurring what's public. It's a, a, um, a very interesting. So, in Islington, we have uh, and Westminster, the two other uh, boroughs, the section 106 basically yeah. polices what I mean, what shouldn't happen. So, it needs to be open to the community and encourages a certain amount of time for different types of activity. Be precise, there's an operator's management plan secured by the one who's six that will deliver this. Okay. And right. I think even that would, would, it means it's a definite thing, not an aspiration. Mm -hmm. And just to add finally, we yep. um, part of that space, you know, we, we've been to be very involved in the programme as far as using it for communities and you know, get, get young people. We make it really porous to young people and local communities, get employers, get tenants starting to invest into those local communities in the space itself. So, mm -hmm. And it means it becomes a destination of space that's busy all the time and has different lives depending on weekend, week, yep. evening, day. Right. And then just on the housing, um, uh, up to I think 78 now, isn't it? Um, uh, units um, with, I think you're your aim is to reach 35% um, yeah. affordable, is that right? What sort of affordable are you thinking of? So to, just just to answer that, um, so the existing Quantum Residential is 38 units, as you've said, which is about 22,000 square foot. 
the scheme you've seen proposed is 78 units, which is roughly double, but actually the floor space is about 78,000 square foot, so it's a tripling, so it's a doubling of units and a tripling floor space. And that's because the units on site are grossly unadvertised, whereas the units we're providing all meet London housing standards and uh, June 2023 London housing standards. Um, in terms of the affordable housing, um, we're hitting 35% and the mix both tenure and typologies is in line with the GLA fast track procedures. So we're going down the GLA fast track route. Okay. Um, heritage assets, I think, um, you know, we're really happy for you uh, that you're um, keeping them because some of those that have come to us have not, um, but um, it's a very good thing. So thank you. Um, Obviously, the ability to they're, they're, they're listed, obviously, so it sort of becomes a bit less of a building control problem um, issue and more of a planning issue about whether how they fit and whether you'll be able to deliver it. I suppose. So, are you sort of confident that these will um, a you'll be able to develop with them in mind, and b they'll sort of fit within the wider? They won't look sort of like little old little old houses surrounded by sort of larger buildings. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah. So, so they will do as little as possible to the um, building on Stratton Street, which we imagine might be part of the affordable work offer. So as little as possible, it's there's it's one or two uh, minor improvements. Um, the web terrace, I think we've already discussed, is substantially improved. But, um, but John, could we just touch on the web terrace? Because they were built originally. It was an original yeah. philanthropic project. They were built sort of the original live work and workshop on the ground floor they had family accommodation above we want to try and keep as close as possible to that original intention as we can get to so we want family accommodation we want them to be townhouses and let's face it it's all now a bit of a blur the live work thing most people work from home um we, we've I, we, we, we've got a view that we can have ground floor with active frontages of people having you know you can have a, a pc and a desk and, and you can have your clients coming to your to your house for for, for a meeting we we just we think that's a great in principle thing to try and embrace and and give these give these buildings their original lives back i think just to say in terms of you know the attention to detail to appreciate the importance of those buildings to the borough is where we've got richard griffiths architects um, as part of the team who specialize in heritage listed buildings so their you know the and attention to detail um is it's very much there yeah. so that's one and two three we take off an 80s extension and the, that, that building remains four is the one that wasn't on any register as being a building of interest which we're keeping as it is uh five is a warehouse that is entirely as its front door to the street is kept as an entity could operate as, as something independent seven we've just talked about is is uh entirely standalone the one that was illustrated is number eight so that's the one that's had the most amount of stuff done to it so that does become incorporated into a bigger building but within that building it it keeps its, its uh, uh definition walls and use. right Thank you. I've got um, Councillor Nycross in the room and then both councillors online. So, Councillor Nycross um, and can, sorry, Councillor Webb, I missed you last time. Okay. Councillor Webb first. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I did want to talk residential, uh, which you um, touched on. So, we've got the answer for the affordable. I mean, I, I get that it is absolutely employment led, but it depends on which policies we wish to apply. It is a priority office area, but we've got other, other plans for the area that says we need way more housing than this scheme brings forward. Um, if we do the site allocation local plan, we should have more units than are coming forward. I do appreciate this is tripling the existing residential area, but that's actually tripling a really small area considered the site of the plan. And I just wondered what, um, you know, I don't want to say flexibility, but I do think there's deliverability in housing schemes. And are we happy that it is only 78 units coming forward with this scheme? 
Uh, is the officers is there a sort of response to that? I mean, given the, the emer or yeah, I mean, in January the emer the direction of travel was looked at by the cabinet for the emerging site allocation. That was agreed at 167 units. The thing about this site is, I suppose, because it's so large, even though it's in a priority office area, you do have the opportunity to put residential on it. Whereas smaller sites that you see commonly in Shoreditch, you might find that you can only put one core on there, so it can only be their office or residential or a hotel, for example. Um, so this is an opportunity, and there would be an opportunity cost to go with a, an employment-led scheme to this extent. I think we're looking at 84% of the scheme would be um, office floor space, effectively. So that will be something that we have to consider, and it will be um in the balance effectively when you're looking at what the public benefits of the scheme are and um, against some of the harms that we identify okay. i mean chair to come up just back on that point i mean housing housing and you know we always have the, the argument um because we're frustrated socialists about affordable housing and the amount that comes forward in these really massive and very exciting. I mean, I love the designs, I like the public realm, I love the widening, the pavements, the really, really good stuff. But I'm just surprised at this, the small number and the small increase, really, given the options, which is bring very exciting buildings, the, the tiny amount of the units, residential units coming forward. That's for the developer then, yeah. So, um, thank you for that. I understand that. We, we have worked really hard, I can look you straight in the eyes, we, we have worked really hard to get as much residential as we can on this site. Any more limits the amount of commercial space. I would take exception, we have got commercial space, but commercial space is not necessarily office space. We've got active ground floors and an awful lot of ground floor space, which will be alternative uses, not plain boring offices. So uh, this is a vibrant area, no. we need to um, celebrate that. We have squeezed as much residential in as we can. If we start to take away, um, you'll get sunlight and daylight issues. You've got people living. We've got we've got some elements of play space. We've got uh, residential we can be proud of. They are uh, double aspect, two staircases, absolutely the, the forefront of design we've, we've got in here. Any more, we're going to compromise it. We're coming away from bed sits with people with tins of beans. We've got absolutely proper high spec to be proud of well curated residential space and it, it's perfect if we take another commercial building away the scheme loses its viability we know about delivering residential we delivered the stage we know what the demand is we understand housing is in a hackney, hackney is in a housing crisis um, we understand it this is a commercial site we've got as much in as we can um, and that really is it. We, 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 have, we are at, at our peak to, to deliver that number of units. We are tripling the floor space, which is pretty substantial offer. No, thank you, Jack. I mean, if I may, just as an adjunct, I mean, we've looked at the London plan policy, which encourages office to be prioritised in the CAS. You know, we've looked at all of your policies. It talks about a minimum amount of office floor space. So, I mean, Howard really said the point I was going to make, you know, it, it's, it's an office-led scheme. We've tried to get as much residential into it as possible. And, and the, we think the policy allows us to sort of proceed on that basis. Okay. Thanks. Uh, that's the Nycross next thing. And two councillors online. Um, my original question was about the heritage assets, but I think you kind of covered that um, well on your previous answer. Uh, so I was just going to ask about the affordable workspace. Um, it says it's part of compliant affordable workspace, and I know it's sort of spread out around the site. Is it all envisioned to be the same sort of condition or different types of affordable space? So if, may I just, sorry, um, there's a question about, so there's two parts out, I think. <laughs> um, there's about affordable workspace. I, I, we haven't talked about the quantum actually, so I'll just cover that off. And then it, uh, the question from the council was around where would it go on site? What does that sort of look like? Which I appreciate you answering. I don't think we've said this, but it's about 44,000 square foot of affordable low cost workspace, which is 10% of the uplift. So therefore it complies with your policy. And um, I did see in the officer's report that you will receive that it identifies that as being about a third of Hackney's identified need to 33. So, you know, just, just like to make that point. 
So, and obviously, space it doesn't fit in one place, so it will be in the number of different places. So, so our, our proposals are still evolving on that, and, and we don't feel necessarily that one size needs to fit all. We've, we've got allocated one particular building, which we can concentrate it, and then we can kind of pepper pot it in. We think um, we're going to be, we're very open to discussion on kind of how we might curate the affordable workspace, because I, I don't think is necessarily a, just one way to deliver it, as I said. Um, we think that the, the whole Green Lab focus, because individually on the ground floors, if we have Green Lab, businesses operating in those spaces they will they will be getting it for free um but we don't necessarily have to have that sitting under a formal workspace provider so there's there's an open conversation to be had along those fronts there's other partners which i mean which there's a lot to get through so we don't want to spend but obviously talk about this for hours but um <laughs> someone like the craft council um who have a what you know the sort of leading body for promoting craft in, in the country and um, we've got a whole range of programs so things called like young craft citizens where they get young people involved in, in crafts from a very early stage and help help promote it so there's all these other types of businesses which we can that can occupy affordable workspace it's not just a case of who's on the registered affordable workspace provider list um you know that can actually do good create a much more diverse community that might just underline a point, Guy. I, I think we'd like to extend an invitation to work with you to shape yeah. this and various other aspects of it. Yeah. We, we really need this to be a sort of symbiotic relationship and a symbiotic process where we can both find what, what actually looks good. You know, you 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 have things that you need to bring into the relationship, but but you, we're just more than willing to entertain your ideas and your inputs and look at what that sort of creative approach would like. We're not here with a fate complete a sort of binary decision making process we'd like this to be part of an ongoing iterative conversation so we can all end up landing somewhere where we're all happy we'll all have to make trade-offs but there's the conversation there to, 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 to do that yeah if you might just worth one second i'm just looking if you look at the presidential the plan so you can see obviously there's the existing one we've introduced that new building but you can see that the shape of the building is trying to um respond to the dual aspect requirements of the site to the right is the is the historic building that we're retaining which is very unsuitable and then if we um look at the office area of the site the whole of the kind of the triangle area etc it'd be very very hard to make any of the residential requirements work for the geometry of the site in that whole area this small building perhaps but that is also the thing you know we, we want that to be you know visible busy everyone looking at it there's maybe it's like the kind of shift to make that residential and we think be a beautiful building but also we're keeping the carbon of what's there at the moment um and the massing of everything along here has been just we did by the by that's residential because it used to be a house so it wouldn't be a residential but because of the scale of this everything here is very very modest and effectively sort of all of this is uh the conservation area scale it's just in in here which is a bigger building so in fact if you actually looked at trying to put residential that has dual aspect in all of the right sort of ways with light on both sides it's very very hard to find any other spot on the site that works so the site's not telling us that there's that it's easy to do um I don't think it would be fantastic if we did do another site tour around the residential because you know we're quite saying um, that, that we want to in the main be the lower scale with an exception. Yeah. So yeah, it's not a it's not a kind of an easy thing, and it's kind of holding out because we can just see where to do it if it's not doing it. But then you know, so to say, well, where would we put the residential that um, is compliant with all of the all of the um, requirements of making a good place to live? We can't see we've lost that opportunity. We've we can't see where that will no i appreciate the, the, the effort to go in maximizing uh, good quality housing and and you can see that obviously that's a far less efficient busy building than it would have been if that's a, an office building yeah yeah so so i think and that's you know, quite a that's a, a quite a big building so we've definitely tried and we've definitely moved a long way from where we started yeah yeah okay um can i bring in councillor young um, hello, it was a, just a quick one on the affordability question. Uh, I wasn't sure that I got from your answer. I got that the you meet the GLA 
requirements. I wasn't sure I got the number of units that will be social housing as opposed to affordable housing or whether they'll all be affordable housing and if so are these all shared ownership or what affordable what's the breakdown or did you say you don't know yet? So there are the 78 units that are physically provided on site within the scheme mm. 35% of those will be affordable, so physically provided within the scheme. Um, secondly, their mix and their tenure type will comply with the GLA's fast track procedure. Therefore, there'll be a mixture of social rent, intermediate and other forms. Does that answer your question? No, what, what's the mix? I'm, I'm looking for numbers. Oh, the precise mix. Oh, we haven't worked through that detail yet. 60% social. Yeah, well, okay. Yeah, six six percent social rent and four percent intermediate. Of the thirty five of thirty five thirty five percent. Sorry, I thought you were asking a more specific question around unit sizes and no, no. Okay, right, yeah, sorry, okay. got it. So and, 60, 40. and and I haven't gained yet a good understanding of kind of which are the best units. Um but do you have any views yet on which of the units would be likely to be the social housing and which would be likely to be the um affordable or private yeah so at the, at the moment we this is not confirmed and i'm sure. not sure we've even presented this to officers yet so so please say that as a caveat but we're con currently considering that the social rent would go in the block facing worship street which we call plot f and the new duplexes to the rear which we call plot l okay and so there's the, yeah sorry go on <laughs> and so i was going to say in the uh, intermediate the uh, 40 percent uh, would be plot l but levels one and two so, okay. so that that plot L levels one and two, sorry, is the building up, up further up the image. Councillor Young, I don't know if you can see what we're pointing at on the screen, but we're trying to point I out. I can see the screen, but yeah. I can't see the pointing. So we're trying to point out plot F and plot L, and I don't. Oh yeah, got know. it. Yeah, L. yeah, I can see. Thank you. That's L there. Yeah. Okay. Did you just say again what's in L? So uh, plot L is both some of the social rent in the Muse duplex to the rear, and uh, we've got some intermediate there as well at the upper levels. And plot F is where the social rent's going facing Worship Street. And so in terms of number of bedrooms, in the, I know I'm kind of getting right down into the detail here, but um, of the larger homes, are any of the larger homes social housing? likely to be social housing so i thought that's the question you were asking me when i said i didn't have that detail oh i see okay <laughs> and i'm just looking at my team here to see if anyone does so no we, we're we're not allocating any of the townhouses uh to social rented as okay. that, it, we don't think they would be taken on particularly the the grade two star listed buildings um um we just don't think that's going to work to try and keep it separate with its own core to reduce service charges but also we, we we have a sense we have tried to engage with the uh with the the housing officer and the, and the regen team to try and get an understanding because we've been told verbally the demand is for smaller more units we've been told that verbally we've tried to get that in writing but it is one of the problems we're trying to get out of the officers at the moment to try and uh secure this point but that's what that's what we're being told right We've met James got a very good officer for the council and we were just yep. to, to work with him. We had a very good meeting with him and we will meet him again. We need a little bit of direction and we'll do our best to meet what the council wants. Okay. Him. Can I I mean just sort of hints and tips for when you come back? Thank you. Um it would be really nice to know whether some of the larger homes could be social housing and you know, I don't have the numbers to hand, but we definitely need larger homes as well as smaller homes in the borough. And I don't think that, you know, no one's going to disagree with me on that. Um, well, it'd just be good to know. I got a sense of where they are. Are they all dual aspect? Is that what you were saying? Everything? Yes. But, okay. Yeah. So yeah. if you weren't having any of the, the townhouses as social housing, you, the largest, that it would be two beds, would it? One bed and two beds. There are some three beds in the Okay. Thank you. That was all. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Young. We've written that down. We'll take we'll take that away. Yeah, take that away. Okay. Councillor Young, Councillor Potter. Um, thank you. Mine my question is about the energy efficiency of the new and refurbished 
um, homes and offices for that matter. So I noticed with the new build, you're aiming for the passive house standard, which is commendable. Um, so it'd be really good to know just some of your initial thoughts on the kind of fabric and materials and how you're aiming to achieve um, that. Um, and in terms of the refurbishment, you, you it's uh, the Letty best practice retrofit. So, you know, and, um, what kind of measures are you, are you going to add in terms of improving the fabric? I know you say somewhere on these slides you're going to repair the historic fabric, but, you know, to achieve that energy rating, you're going to have to add, you know, significant improvement so initial um thoughts well, initial thoughts the, the refurbished buildings will all have to have significant insulation added internally where the internal finishes allow that um so we'll upgrade the insulation performance where possible um and and, and all, you know, all aspects of the envelope um then and, and obviously we're looking at a, a new sort of energy systems etc that allow that um the operational carbon to be a lot lower um, in in use the passive house is obviously a completely different thing so there's a very very highly um specified very deep walls um uh, control of ventilation etc cetera, etc cetera. so we'll try and, and and this obviously will have to be building by building be at Centered to all the key features of the refurbished buildings, but improving their performance wherever we can. Just as we have, we have done this on some other buildings, and obviously for the web building, which is the most sensitive, we have a, uh, a an expert architect in that. I don't want to add any anything more. No, we we already covered off the district heating network, which is a massive improvement. Complete removal of gas on site for for the residential, and it's got the consumer protection. So I think obviously we we have to respect the Grade Two star listed buildings very carefully, and um, we've had some positive uh, some meetings with with heritage offices on that, and and um, we'll continue to progress that. Also, just to say on that, we've also been engaging with um, for Historic England. To, yeah. On, on the web tariffs. And... Yeah. Great. Thank you. Is that okay, Councillor Potter? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Great. Thanks very much. Um, any other questions from the committee? No. Anyone online? Doesn't look like it. Great. Okay. Looks like a really exciting uh, project. Uh, thanks very much for bringing it to us and for giving us the opportunity to uh, give it a run through and see what's uh, see what's happening. Um, good luck in your further conversations. Thank you. I know, uh, but thank you very much for your time. So, um, thank, you. Thank, you. Right. thank you very much. Thank you. Right, do you want me to do something now? Um, just for the committee, I think, uh, just to note the next um committee dates are second meeting on the Wednesday, the 3rd of April, and then the next planning pre-app is proposed for the 20th of november 2024 so yeah that one is uh, um but thank well, you, you like to <laughs> thanks to all the officers this evening thank you to everyone online councillors and officers online and everyone watching um that's the meeting close, close. thank close. you very much yeah. thank, thank you, you. thank you thank you, um, thank you